We're clapped in. Clap for the wolf man. He gonna take your record high. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're here. We're yeah, here baby. at the Heaven House. Awesome. Absolutely love being here. Me too. What kind of tea are we drinking right now? A Buddha Pure Mind. And what's in the Buddha Pure Mind? I don't know, but no, I know not it, off the top of your hand. I know it head? vaporizes really good, and when I got a lot of work to do, it gives me a nice, smooth, gentle, non-buzzed cognitive performance that I like. I like that big time. Well, usually when I'm here, I like to take a take a look and tune into the books mm. and see uh, what I can draw from you. But today, I knew right when I was coming here, thanks to a couple of big journeys that I've had recently. Mm. And thanks to to you telling me uh, that there's another book that you want to write eventually. Oh, there's a few, yes. But I don't want to talk God. Oh, God, love God. We're never, I've never, never really gone down the the uh, rabbit hole. I'm not even sure. You and I are always talking about health and learning and you know stuff for the regular world, the consensus reality. Well, the beautiful pieces, the the foundational pieces that allow us to explore. Like if Maslow's hierarchy is is correct for sure, but there should also be that that little piece in there. I guess there is on food and security and shelter, yeah. Yeah. but also taking care of your body, right? That is yeah. the temple. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And then from there, we can explore these other realms and dive deeper. It's the divine mirror, but you know, if you don't, if you don't nourish your body, I tell people your body's like a dog. If it's hungry, it won't stop pestering you. If it's thirsty, it won't stop pestering you. If it needs your attention, it won't let you meditate. But if you love and care for your body, then the biology isn't trying to commandeer the psychology. So that gives you the platform to launch, whether it be in meditation, astral travel, or plant medicine experiences. But I, when I lead ceremonies, I'm always very conscious of and give clear directions on, you know, don't come low blood sugar. Um, if your body's got aches and pains, go in the gym and stretch, mobilize, do whatever you got to do to nourish your body so you can leave it safely as an anchor to your a tail on your kite. If you don't have the body taken care of, then the farther out you go, the more it is like a kite without a tail. It just starts going all over the place and you get trapped in your you know, the, the cries for the body saying, what did you and leaving? I'm hungry or I'm thirsty or you're not loving me. I got all me. these kinks. I got all this yeah. blocked energy. What, do you, what are you doing loving something else when you should be loving me? I'm the one that gives you life. No doubt about it. Well, I wanted to tell you, you know, it's funny too, because this, this just popped into my head. Um, the first time I was over here, you said uh, on the topic of plant medicines that you had to have a strong ego. Mm-hmm. In order to go that deep, you do. And, and and when you mentioned that to me, I couldn't help but laugh because you said that about me and Aubrey. And then I was like, "Well, yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, for sure, that's true." But in working with you know some of these deeper journeys, and I mean you know w- way far exceeding the Terrence McKenna heroic dose of five grams. Of <laughs> yeah, that's just what I call the shamanic dose for the average person. If you go less than that, you're you're still got one foot in your ordinary psyche, your ordinary sense of yourself. Four grams, three grams, two grams. Those are, you know, for people that may not be ready to deal with the flow of their unconscious. But, you know, once you go above five grams, then then you have to be more um, stable in yourself and have a better and better relationship with yourself and with God. Or you're going to think that you're having a bad trip and and blame it on the medicine or blame it on something else, not realizing you're getting a, a tour of the the hall of records in your head. You're programming. Yeah, yeah. And when you said that to me, I thought like, well, that's a funny thing to say to somebody. And then you know, having gone to the depths that I have now, I had so much gratitude that I had this ego to come back to, mm-hmm. a grounding cord of my personality that mm. I knew would be there waiting for me after even thinking I was dead for a very long time. Yeah. Something to return home to. Mm. Well, let's let's just let's just dive into a couple of things. You've mentioned a couple of different books here. Uh, we were talking about the DMT dialogues. You mentioned um, this one Mind to Matter with Dawson Church that mm-hmm. I just finished and you have a podcast with him on 
uh, on, on my yours. Living 4D with Paul Check. Yeah, and it's a beautiful podcast. Okay, so I definitely want to send people there. We'll link to it in the show notes. But there was another book that you mentioned, um, I think even prior to the one with Andrew Gilmore on uh, levels of consciousness. It was the guy who oh, invented the, the helicopter. The, the Reflexive Universe by Arthur M. Young. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a couple of them. I'm brain farting on the title of the other one. He's not far from here, but uh, anyhow, his stuff is phenomenal. I, I've watched many interviews with him and documentaries and studied a lot of his work, and it's just excellent. Yeah, and I, I, I'm curious about that because he's trying to model what consciousness looks like. Is that correct? I haven't read the book yet. But. Well, what he does is he shows you the structure stages of consciousness based on his investigation. He took his money that he made from inventing the Bell helicopter and invested it into an institute to study consciousness. So he spent a lot of time, and he's a very, very smart guy. I mean, you're talking about a guy that's well put together here. <laughs> Imagine the guy that invented the Bell helicopter. So um, he's very, very well put together metaphysically as well, spiritually. So he's grounded, um, but his mind reaches the edges of existence. Yeah, and I think, um, I guess where I'm going with this this conversation is, I'd read this book by Martin H. Ball, or Martin Ball. He's a PhD. He wrote uh, Entheogenic Liberation. It's all on 5-MeO-DMT, mm-hmm. which is a fantastic molecule. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's in a league of its own. Mm-hmm. And with that experience, for people who aren't familiar, it is the direct contact with source, the direct contact with God. And it, obviously, it's dose-dependent, but if you do it, if you do enough, you will get there without fail. And it's kind of, in my opinion, the antithesis to being asleep. Like if you were an mm-hmm. atheist and you knew you weren't going to die doing this, you have nothing to lose, give it a try. And then you'd be like, oh, fuck. Okay, I get it. Anyways, in his book, he, he describes that experience very well. But what he fails to acknowledge is other entities, other uh, healing past traumas. He says it's all bullshit. It's all a fallacy of the mind. And I'm like, well, clearly... He has a preference for 5-MeO, but also clearly he hasn't gone deep enough with ayahuasca or psilocybin or any of these other medicines that would show the reality of that as true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a, another perspective I would share with you on that. I've studied quite a lot of Ken Wilber's research on structure stages of consciousness, and there's a very good book right here called um, Streams of Wisdom, which this book is really the creme de la creme investigation into the structure stages of consciousness, and it's based on a lot of research, and it's by one of Ken Wilber's top people who is a highly, highly intelligent, highly evolved man named Dustin DiPerna, and it outlines the structure stages and the history of them, and, and very much like Gene Gebser's work. Um, there's another great book by Jeremy Thomas called Seeing Through the World. So it shows the structure stages based on Gene Gebser's investigations. And Gene Gebser is one of the people that Ken Wilber references a lot. And um, what he shows in here, to put a lot of technical language simply, uh, no Christian will ever see Buddha in an Enlightenment experience. No, no um, Muslim is going to see Jesus uh, or Buddha. So what what he's really saying is that the only interpretive faculty you have in any kind of an experience is your own mind. What you're describing about this guy is someone who's only seeing what he has allowed himself to emotionalize or basically bring into his own programming structure. So, you know, there's, in my opinion, there's aliens here all the time. And, you know, I've, I'm clairvoyant, so I can see disembodied souls. And there, there's all there, there's lots of them. And especially if you go to a bar or a place where there's a lot of uh, drinking or, or drugging or, or so-called spiritual circles where there's a lot of drugs being used because uh, psychedelics chemically open your energy field. So you can't regulate your own chakras. So entities can walk right into you when you're on a plant medicine, which is why uh, the medicine carrier, the shaman, whoever's in charge of clearing the space and creating sacred space and sancretizing it, making it sacred, 
And this is why we use sage and, and incenses and frankincense and things. Flower to, bath down in the Amazon. To, to create yeah. a field that entity, negative entities that are repelled by it. They don't like that kind of energy. But if somebody, my point is, you know, very few people see these things. And if I tell the wrong people I see these things, they immediately discredit me and think I'm an idiot. So it's also, you see, when they teach people how to bend spoons with their mind, they find children learn it very quickly and very easily because they don't have a belief structure that says it can't happen. They, they aren't, shall we say, um, programmed with Newtonian physical ideas. Whatever's possible, if they see someone else do it, they go, well, how'd you do that? And they show them and they do it. But adults have typically a very hard time learning that where kids can learn it, you know, in, in a half an hour, an hour or two, some adults can practice for months and not get it. So what I'm really saying is lots of people using the same medicines at the same doses have radically different experiences because you can only really interpret. You could be with Buddha, but if you're not a Buddhist, you wouldn't even see Buddha. You wouldn't even know what you were looking at. So because God's unconditional love, you can't see God as this or that. You can only see an idea that you have in your psyche, and that's what the research really shows. And this is why, you know, the plant medicines are powerful, because they unlock the unconscious. So, they let all the ideas and beliefs and fears that you have trapped in your unconscious that you repress because either they make you feel afraid or they make you feel insecure or they make you feel separate from people that you love— but as soon as you open Pandora's box with a psychedelic medicine and you start disabling the default mode network, the unconscious just flows up into the surface like an artesian well. And that's what I call opening Pandora's box. So if you, you don't have the skills and you haven't been properly trained how to manage that and how to use your mind and how to use your breathing and how to activate your root chakra to anchor you in a lower frequency range so you don't feel like you're dying... Um, then you just end up swimming in your own unconscious, and that's what people call a bad trip. But I have to remind people all the time, it's called a shamanic journey because if you are in control, it's not a journey. You're just getting high. Any idiot can do that. But if you want to grow spiritually, then you have to be brave enough to die into yourself. So I'm trying to answer your question by simply saying, you can read lots of books by people that have done the same medicines at the same doses, and it's like they're in completely different worlds because they're in completely different minds. Yeah, that makes that makes so much sense to me. It is. <laughs> thank you for offering that. That that puts everything in perspective there. And it's it's curious to me because I was telling you about this book, the DMT Dialogues, that I just finished, which is fantastic. Uh, it's got Rupert Sheldrake, Graham Hancock, a lot of uh, Dennis McKenna, uh, Rick Strassman, a lot of people that I really look up to in this space. And the conversation is all around entities. And I've had DMT a decent number of times. And I have never experienced, I shouldn't say never, I've only experienced like an ancestor, someone mm -hmm. who's passed on, show up to help. Mm -hmm. Never really experienced uh, other entities. And then through these other practices and different tools and plant medicines, after having read that book, I've seen them with my eyes open. It's well, like it's, it's available now. You have a framework now. That's exactly my point. You see... I'm an art therapist. If I take a mandala that one of my patients painted, and maybe you don't know they have cancer or sexual trauma or whatever, and I put this piece of art in front of you and say, well, tell me what you know about this person from looking at their art, you're probably just going to have to guess. But when you know how to read symbols and when you can access that person's soul and empty yourself so you become a mirror, then the vibration that is programmed into that, just like a person's signature carries their vibration. If, if I didn't know you and somebody gave me something with your signature on it, all I'd have to do is touch that and empty myself when I touch it and all sorts of information about you. I might even start seeing visions of you. And I've demonstrated this to people beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's no question. It's, it's doable. And there's lots of people that can do that. I've even taught lots of my students to do these th types of things. Um, but, uh, the other thing I was trying to, I, I kind of lost where I was going, but the other thing I wanted to point out is that 
if you're open-minded, oh, so what I was saying with the art is that if I then taught you art therapy techniques and said, okay, when you see this symbol, or like I said to you today when you came and I saw your mandala was blowing out of the circle, that symbolizes you're going to move out of your ordinary reality or what I would call your universe, and you're going to leak, your consciousness is going to leak into any surrounding universe. Then if we look at the position using the north, south, east, west coordinates, I can tell you based on where that's leaking, what you're likely to experience there because it has to do with how energy moves in the solar system and in, in the cosmos, which is what astrology is. And I'm not talking about foo-foo astrology. I'm talking about the effects of space-time of living bodies and the effects of time-space on the entities that inhabit it and create those bodies. And Steiner goes into this at great length for people that are interested. But... Um, once you got the basics of how to read a mandala, and I said, okay, now look at it, and I hadn't told you anything about the person, right away you would start saying, hmm, well, based on what you taught me, that looks to me like there's a lot of chaos going on in his body. And this over here looks like an eye that's crying, and there must be some trapped emotion. And you'd say, there's a lot of black in this. And you taught me that that represents a transition or something that's being held in the dark within themselves. And so all of a sudden, all sorts of meaning would come out. And then if you were to interview that person and say, well, I looked at your art, I just have a few questions based on what I saw and what I felt in the art. I felt a lot of sadness and a lot of anxiety. Are you feeling sad or anxious about something. And lo and behold, they would say, yes, you know, my dog died and it's really been hard for me. And I'm anxious because I feel sad that if I choose another one, it's almost like I'm losing connection to my lover. Like, you know, when, when someone's spouse dies, they often takes them quite a while to get to the point where they feel good about having another lover because there's still that sense of I'm leaving the person I love behind. So there's a transition period and black means transition. So, what happens is, as we mature in our psyche, and we come to trust the magic and the mystery of the divine, we then become able to relax. And when we see things or feel things or perceive things that we don't have a framework for, in, in the system I teach my students, that's what your soul is for. Your soul is God encapsulated as an individual being. Kyle Kingsbury is God as Kyle Kingsbury. There will never be another one of you. And you won't even be the same one again. You might be a woman in your next life, but you certainly won't have this body and these fingerprints. You won't be the same guy. Your soul will be the same. You will carry all the knowledge and wisdom from past lives forward. But if I ran into you in your next lifetime, the only way I would recognize you is from the essence that pours through you from your heart, and I would experience you inside of me, and an awakening might come like, my God, that woman is Kyle. And I would probably be talking to you and asking you special questions to find out if it was safe to say, I'm curious, do you know anything about your past lives? In other words, I wouldn't want to alienate you before I started investigating and if you didn't, I might start saying things to you that might trigger those memories or say, um, would you like to do a, a past life regression? Because I already have a strong sense of who you are, but I would want to demonstrate that objectively through you. But the key point I'm driving at is that you reach a point where you can actually come into other dimensions of reality where nothing looks like anything here. Like I've been in dimensions where there's nothing but geometrical forms, but somehow they're talking to me, listening to me, communicating to me. I'm talking to them and I'm having a relationship with a star tetrahedon, just like I'm talking to you right now. And it's as real and as vibrant and as alive. And you can even feel them breathing half the time. I mean, they're like, they're breathing, you know, so a person who's already programmed not to believe in God or not to believe in entities would, would probably just see geometrical forms, but wouldn't be open enough to interact with them and therefore would have a very different experience. And so the journey ends and they say, wow, did you see all those geometrical forms? Yes, yeah, lots of them. Did you talk to them? 
No, I never thought a triangle could talk. So you see there their own perceived limitations get in the way of the depth of the experience. But what I've found is as I've grown deeper and deeper into connection with my soul, that I turn my ego over to my soul. So my conscious perception of self, my choice-making faculty, my, my labeling faculty, I just say, show me whatever it is that you want me to see so that I can live in love fully and help other people more effectively in whatever way it is I'm here to do. And when things happen that I can't make heads or tails of, I ask my soul to guide me and show me, and all of a sudden I realize I'm dealing with a being from another dimension, but it may have taken the shape of a cloud of gas, or it might have taken the sh- it might manifest as a an insect or as something that I can't make heads or tails of with my rational mind. But then when I start interacting with them, I can ask them questions. And that's one of my favorite things to do. You, you, and so what you find out when you realize it's all God, then you, you start finding out that, you know, God's, the age of God is eternal. <laughs> so imagine if you've been manifesting in different forms forever, how many things you've tried and how many ways you express yourself and it's infinite, right? So I've always just been mind boggled at the many, many ways great spirit will communicate to us and teach us and guide us and manifest. But the secret is you, 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 most people are the greatest limiting factor on their experience because fear closes the door to opportunity and until when I said you guys to you guys, you need to have a, a strong ego to go deep on the medicines, I mean you have to be able to face confusion, emptiness, fear, the unusual, and still maintain your center. You know, like when I used to race motocross, I would be going so fucking fast. I was right on the edge of flying off the track and just hitting a tree and dying. And that's the edge you got to find. And when you get out of control on a motorcycle like that, you learn never let go of the handlebars. Stay with it until you have no choice, but you're either ripped off or you let go because you never know when you can save it. And I've saved saved myself in instances where people would have let go long ago. And the point is you learn not to let the fear cause you to act unconsciously and just let go. So when I'm down going in these deeper journeys, which I love to do, I'm in many situations where I'm like feeling like I'm completely being annihilated or being dissolved or I've come into contact with negative entities that are, tell me, tell you, man, (laughs) that make your heart jump and skip and I've seen some wild stuff and that's when I have to say to my soul, dear soul, please protect me. And then I visualize myself and a shield of golden light or purple light or white light. And I'll start talking to them. Why are you here? And, you know, things like that. But most people would just go unconscious at something like that because the fear of it, you know, you know how people see someone bleed and they just not go unconscious. Many people, when they go to surgery for the first time, will just pass out. (laughs) Doctors are always watching very carefully. So what I meant by that is not that you need a strong ego like, you're brave enough to walk in the room and be rude to people or you got a big ego like you're an asshole or you're full of yourself. I mean, a strong ego means you can face adversity and face even the annihilation of yourself, which is what real warriors are trained to do, face death and stay focused because ultimately spiritual practices are all there to teach you to stay conscious when you die. So if you And that's what plant medicines give you the opportunity to do at the right dose is die and live. And I've been so deep in journeys. When I came back, I was dancing the fucking jig going hallelujah because I thought I would never see my wives or my kids or or, uh, anything again. I'm like, (laughs) I was like, you know, when you enter the absolute, my God, it's... Wow, <laughs> that was that was me eight days ago. Yeah, but you touched on a good a good uh, a good point here, and it's something they bring up. I think in the introduction of the DMT dialogues, 
was this idea that when you come across the fearful, the fearful point of your journey, mm-hmm. no matter what the medicine, of course, this whole book's on DMT alone, but the answer is yes. Mm-hmm. If you want to go deep, you say yes. Mm-hmm. If that scary thing in front of you wants to take you somewhere, you say yes, because yeah. that's what allows the journey to expand. Yeah, It's when you say no and live in fear, that fucking closes it off and you're back in your body. Shit, I should have said yes. Well, Grand God's Hancock. a perpetual yes. God's unconditional love. So the answer to every request is yes, whether it's conscious or unconscious. That's why Arnold Arnold Patton says in his Universal Principles, if you don't like what's happening in your life, look carefully at what you're choosing unconsciously. So the point I'm making is a lot of our requests are unconscious. And when we're in an experience like that and something negative is coming, you have to have enough sense of self or that strong ego to say, well, if that reality exists that I'm seeing, then by the law of mind, its complementary opposite must exist. So behind every cloud of gray is a silver lining. But if you if you let fear be your guide, you won't look for the silver lining. And I've had uh, cases, I, 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 I can give you a, a, a clinical example. I had a, a young man who, who uh, had a very severe case of obsessive compulsive disorder that came on after... Um, he got a testicular torsion that was very bad. It almost killed him. They had to rush him to the hospital. And um, after the surgery, this what he described as this very dark entity began coming to him every time he fell asleep and it would scare the living hell out of him. And it, he kind of, I'm just remembering, it's been a couple of years since we finished our therapy, but he described it as a female entity that was very dark, kind of like a the, the a black witch, a dark witch from the dark arts. And, and, you know, piercing eyes, and it was scared the hell out of him. And 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 due to the trauma of the surgery and the experience, he began to having these thoughts that would repeat endlessly in his head, and and it would just drive him out of his mind. Literally, you know, he thought he was going crazy, and he went to lots of doctors and therapists, and nothing helped him at all. The drugs they gave him just made him worse. But when I was working with him, I started by teaching him how to work with his power animals. And I I took him through a ceremony and uh, taught him and found his power animals with him and for him and gave him practices to learn to work with his psyche. But when he got to the point where he had enough inner skills to work in those other dimensions, I said, now, when that entity comes to you, I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to talk to her and say, why are you in my life? If God is unconditional love, then you can only be a messenger to help me. I want to, this is me pretending to be him, I want you to tell me why you're in my life and why you are so scary to me. And she ultimately said, I'm here to help you. I've been here to help you all along. And she explained him the reason she was there Part of what was happening is is because he was traumatized and he was on uh, drugs and he had come out of anesthesia, his mind's frame of reference was very skewed because his body was in pain, he was in pain, he was scared. So he'd actually developed his psychic reference from a negative perspective. But once, and it it took, uh, this was probably about, a year and a half into therapy with me because I had to give him the tools to know how to work with an entity like that and how to stay centered and not be afraid. But then I told him, work with her every day. Well, it didn't take but a couple of months and his OCD significantly reduced to the point that he was very normal and now he has his own clinical practice as a Czech professional. His father's an orthopedic surgeon, a very intelligent man and He's a loving guy, and and I told him when he came to me, this injury was because soul's guiding you to me for an internship because you have soul contracts with people that are going to require a lot of inner work because you're going to run into many people that have these kind of psychic crises going on, and you would never know how to help them until you had to unravel your own. And he's, for in fact, he was just in HLC3 with me for the last six days and shared his emotions and how amazing it was for him. And he recently went with his girlfriend to where he used to live in South Carolina and took her to the park next to his apartment where he did of almost every day, did the inner work that I taught him. And he said he had just tears pouring out of him because he said, 
It brought me back to when I first started with you and I thought I was completely and utterly fucked. I thought my life was over. I was, he thought he was going to commit suicide. And he said, and his girlfriend's a medical doctor and he, he was explaining all this to her and he was saying, Paul, it's just so amazing to, to be able to go back to that place and, and kind of have like a mini life review and see where I'm at today and how far we got and how I use these tools you taught me with people every day now. And I'm, happy and I've got my own practice. I'm making a great living. And he says, it's like, I'm alive again, you know? But you see, my point in sharing that is if a person, that's the function of a shaman. That's the function of, you know, I consider myself more of a modern shaman because I use depth psychology. I I study people like Arnold Mandel and, and, you know, you can see my library is full of it, right? But, and I, and I meet with guides and elders and people from other dimensions that teach me things. I've learned I've learned more from people in other dimensions than I have from this one. And uh, and this is most of this teaching is not done on psychedelics. It's done just in meditative states. But uh, you know, all I'm trying to outline is that a person's frame of reference determines what they're going to see. Because if you don't have a container for something, how do you um, make any meaning out of it or or convert the symbol into an experience. If we see a cat, we all agree that's a cat. But if you see a cat with 10 legs and three heads, you you may have a hard time deciding if it's a cat or if it's something completely different. And if it's something completely different, just looking at it might scare the shit out of you. So um, as we grow and we develop a relationship with spirit or source or soul, that part of us is, is God. And that part of us has the wisdom of the universe in it. And we can ask any question to that part of ourselves. And this is where all the geniuses get their answers to their big problems from Einstein to you name it. There's loads of them that go into these meditative states and use psychedelics. I mean, Francis Crick was using LSD when he figured out the double helix pattern. Um, You know, I'm not saying this to tell everyone to run out and do drugs. That's not real smart. Um, Unless you're well supported and guided and can do it intelligently and it's the right thing for you to do generally if you're scared it's the wrong thing to do if you're like (laughs) okay i'm ready um but i think that um this is the reason you see books written about i mean look how many diet books are written about this is the end all be all but they're all writing about their own experience yeah you know they're all writing about their own experience all right i'm going to shift gears here um another thing they brought up to me that well in i think it's it's in the intro of dmt dialogues again is um there was an encounter with a lady who, who it's, it's a talk. So everyone gives a talk each day. And in her talk, she talked about coming across something that looked like this, the, the most, the largest version of the devil she'd ever come across. Mm-hmm. And it was basically speaking to her in this demonic voice saying, you humans are so stupid. You think it goes from you to God, mm-hmm. which is really what Martin Ball was saying, because mm-hmm. that's his experience through his lens. Mm-hmm. But he says, there are layers and yeah. levels of consciousness. Mm-hmm. You don't go straight home. And I remember you telling me before, uh, of course, this is, I mean, this is just for, for conversation, but I remember you telling me before that uh, Earth is, and I'm paraphrasing here, but Earth is the elementary school. It is. Mm-hmm. For consciousness. For souls. For souls. There are evolved souls here that came here to, you know, work as school teachers if you want a like metaphor a bodhisattva yeah wow. they're here to help share their wisdom and their past life experience and um you know they they're they're here because they understand it's all god um so they're nourishing i mean god can only know itself through sentient beings that's what we are as alan watts says the universe is a peopling universe and if you look at many many books and documentaries on alien encounters the grand majority of the aliens that people encounter are built similar to humans. They might be smaller, they might have big heads, but they all have two eyes, one nose and a mouth and fingers and hands and feet and four extremities. And, and you know, so my point is, is that, and, and me as an astral traveler and remote viewer, I've looked all over the place. And, and with the exception of beings that are like insects, which I was telling you about and a few others, mostly what I see, no matter where I go, is is something very human-like, and most of them recognize me as uh, very similar to them, and 
talk to me and you can go to places where there's people from different dimensions that are also doing, you know, interdimensional travel. Um, so, uh, anyhow, my point is that there's, it is a peopling universe and the earth is really, um, a place for souls that come to embodiment and go through a series of lifetimes where they actually grow their consciousness out of matter. So scientific materialism is is typically a sign of a quite immature soul. Yeah, with regard to you know these multiple lifetime experiences, that's something that I had I had considered and n- never really gave much thought into it. And then through ayahuasca and asking questions and receiving some pretty deep downloads, I remember this Carl Sagan quote, that if the earth was the only place where there was intelligent life in the universe, what an incredible waste of space. Exactly. Right? And then I thought, oh, that makes sense for reincarnation as well. Mm -hmm. If this was our only life, and since the known creation of the universe, what an incredible waste of time. We are here Mm -hmm. for a fucking fraction of a blink of an eye. Yeah. If it's just one and done. And no one gets to Christ consciousness or the Buddha level or name someone else that was a great teacher on this planet. No one gets there in a single lifetime. No. You know, what rises up in me to share with you is simply this. If you are having an experience that is life, I don't care where you're at. I don't care if you're in a strange dimension where you're talking to triangles or where you're talking to insectoid aliens or you're speaking to disembodied souls and what we call ghosts. Uh, I don't care what drug you're on. I I don't care, uh, you know, where the schizophrenic says that they are that seems completely outrageous to everybody else in a consensus reality. Um, I mean, when you really look at what consciousness is, consciousness is non-local. So that uh, that now you just take the lines off the map and just put dots around the edge, which means it goes forever. And anything you can conceive, God is conceiving, and anything that God conceives is what you can conceive. Because if it wasn't already in the potential of God, it would be inconceivable. And since God is absolute, there's nothing that can be conceived that isn't within God. And the other thing is, we are sort of trapped in this sort of reality of the earth and time and, you know, rocks and geology. And and it took this long, or, you know, in the Bible, it took X number of days for God to create the world. But if you, for example, study the law of one, where Ra describes how they built the some of the Egyptian temples, they say they weren't built by hand. They are thought forms. These are entities from sixth dimension who have the development to focus their mind and manifest matter, magnetize matter to the thought. And they then, you know, the the questioners said to them, well, then why why are they in these big blocks? And they said, well, we knew specifically that people wouldn't be ready to handle the fact that something like that could be created in one moment in time as one piece. So we specifically designed it just to look just enough like it must have been built by people so that their minds would be able to grapple with the reality that they were facing. But you can't move 100-ton blocks of stone with fucking yeah, wooden rollers. Like they could have scaled it down slightly if donkeys. they wanted it to be more believable from, well, the, you know, they, from the slave context. There's other things the- like there's the hieroglyphics and there's all the things that make it you know more like, oh, someone carved these. But the, the point that I'm making is... Um, and there's a good book called Quantum Leaps or Quantum Jumps by Cynthia Sue Larson and, and um, Fred Allen Wolf talks about that. Uh, I've got one of his books over there. Um, what's it called? It's called uh, Taking the uh, Quantum Leap. But there's people that understand this. And, it, you know, when you really, when you get down to the base of it, everything that's made out of matter is made out of electrons, protons, neutrons and subatomic particles, and science shows that these things emerge from the zero-point field, which is really the gateway to the absolute. There's nothing you can know behind it, but current investigations show that, I think Nassim Harriman says there's enough 
There is more energy in one cubic centimeter of empty space than there is in all the matter in the known universe. So what am I saying? God, the, the, the amount of energy and potential in God, even in empty space, is inconceivably vast. Uh, Irvin Laszlo says empty space is about, it's either eight or 900 times more dense than steel with a friction coefficient of zero. So just like a fish is swimming in water and doesn't know it, I mean, try offering a fish a glass of water, he won't even know what you're talking about. Um, we're moving in the matrix, and the matrix is intensely packed with energy, intensely packed with life, and the level of consciousness within God is such that it can actually manifest a world. So when you go into deep enough into these psychic states or deep enough into a journey, you can actually manifest a world just by thinking about it. And when you are doing astral travel, one of the things that makes astral travel so hard for people is that wherever your mind goes, that's what you experience. So if you're thinking evil thoughts, you will experience those thoughts and they will manifest as though you're with beings or whatever you're thinking about. But then all of a sudden, if you shift to love, it'll be like you're in a completely different dimension and you create it as quick as you thought about it. Be because God being absolute, the emptiness of God meets the fullness of God, and therefore you have the polarity. The emptiness of God is yin, or what David Bohm calls the implicate, which is seeded with all the potential ideas of the absolute. And then yang is the explicate, that which is expressing itself as something tangible, knowable, measurable, experienceable. The Tao in the world of 10,000 things. Right, so you have the Tao that can't be spoken, that's the implicate, and the Tao that can be spoken, that's the explicate. So we're living in the Tao. Everything you can see, the whole universe is the Tao that can be spoken. But um, because the two realities of the absolute are that it's empty of everything, yet the plenum, Plotinus said the vacuum is simultaneously the plenum. What he was saying 2,300 and something years ago, 70 something years ago, he was deep. He said that what you think of as empty space is bursting with creativity, bursting with life, bursting with activity. It's not empty at all. And so, the point that I'm making is the emptiness becomes the fullness. And because we need time to have an experience, the fullness is constantly in transition towards some relative degree of emptiness. You build an empire, and it dissolves. You people the earth, and they start to disappear. You build a planet, and one day it's destroyed by asteroids. You build a sun, and it explodes as a supernova, and then it just disperses itself into the emptiness and becomes another star. So the point I'm making is that those are the two polarities of mind, and since those are the two states of God that exist within the absolute, the relative can only exist because the absolute contains it, and it is the relative, the two qualities of the absolute, is full of everything, and empty of everything, and those two are becoming each other at the speed of now, and therefore you have the base frequency with, with which God's mind works, and that's why as you move into these higher dimensions, your thoughts manifest as a dimension, as a reality at the speed of thought, because you're creating at the speed of now, and that's the power of the mind of God. So what I'm really saying is, we think of the earth as this historical thing, but we don't realize maybe all of us dream this thing into existence. And we dreamed it exactly as it is to create the experience that we're having so that we would learn from the experience more about what we really are, or maybe our ancestors did it, or maybe our future selves have done it. There's lots of ways you can skin the cat. But at the end of the day, the one thing that I think it's the most important to remember about God is God's an absolute mystery. No matter what I say about God, it's only my experience of it. I get excited about sharing because I hope to inspire people to have their own experience, and I've spent a lot of time studying and developing techniques for having these experiences so that others can explore their own relationship with God. But at the end of the day, you can't say anything about God objectively. You just can't, and if you do... Um, then you don't understand what God is. You can talk about your experiences. You can talk about your own mental frame of reference. You know, Christian fundamentalists have their ideas about God. All fundamentalists do. Um, mystics 
often have radically different ideas about God. In fact, Rumi said, you'll never get to God until you become a heretic, which means until you get rid of all the ideas that other people have programmed programmed into you about God, you're never going to know what God is. You're only going to just keep re-enlivening the own, your images of your own ideas. And Osho called those thought forms, and Ledbetter calls them thought forms. But Osho you know, talks at length about how people deify what they think of as God, but not realizing that it's just a thought form. And the more people that you have buying into um, Shiva or Brahma or Krishna or Jesus, the stronger the thought form gets because you have a convergence of consciousness. So, it manifests itself as a, as a living being. And, and it's as real as, I mean, when I say to you, who are you? And you say, I'm Kyle. You just use the thought form. <laughs> Without the thought form, you, there would be no way for you to understand what I just said to you and, re, and relay it back to me. You just blew my fucking mind. <laughs> oh, good, good. I love it. Well, yeah. my name's Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think when you're talking a lot about um, the back and forth between the emptiness and what we see as matter, that, that interchanging relationship, it, it put things in perspective for me that I've been diving into with guys like Dr. Joe Dispenza mm -hmm. and, and, and Dr. Bruce Lipton when it comes to working... Um, Working with the potential fields, you know, yeah. working with with calling things in mm -hmm. to reality. But what you said towards the end there, put it in one hundred percent one hundred percent perspective for me was, when you get deep enough, we have the power to create. We have the power to call in. We have the power to manifest instantly. We're doing it all the time. We're not only doing it individually; we're doing it collectively. If you want to move a mountain, you can go out there with a shovel or you can get together with a lot of people and get the right tools and move a mountain. If you want to create a world, well, you can start by creating that world in your head and that becomes the blueprint. For example, if you, you know, I've got books on healing. Uh, I've got one by a New Zealand shaman healer and he describes and documents how the Taoist monks 900 years ago, the, actually the Buddhist monks 900 years ago documented that when the sperm met the egg and gestation kicked off, instantly the entire energy field of that child manifested. And these monks were clairvoyant. They could see this stuff very clearly. They, could, they mapped out the acupuncture meridians. You know, they're like shaman that can see the energies. And... They describe that the cells divide and become teeth and become eyes, not by some magical accidental process, but they're actually following the energetic blueprint. But the point I'm making is that blueprint is in the mind of the universe. So the act of gestation creates a polarization, and the DNA of the two parent cells is actually a cosmic antenna what we call junk DNA, in my opinion, is the DNA that communicates with all the other things, such as the elements, the earth, the water, the fire, the air, the surrounding elements, the other creative forces that make a human being a human being and make the whole thing work. But the point I'm making is when those, when the sperm and the egg meet, it activates the antenna system of the DNA, which taps it into the fields of information that then direct the flow of energy and information into form and then the soul actually can move into its new temple, its new um, abode or place of experience. And the soul has, according to Plotinus, has three chief qualities. One, it abides. It witnesses. It reflects. So, it's constantly reflecting on all the experiences it's having at every level of its experience, and it represents itself. So, when you go into medicine journeys, as you know, oftentimes you see ways that you could love people better or loved yourself better or, uh, you know, that's reflection. And to the degree that you use that as a spiritual practice, then the next day you say, I'm going to love my wife better. I'm going to love my kids better. I'm going to love myself better. I'm, I'm going to be more conscious about how I treat the world. I'm not going to be abusive to the planet, whatever it is. And so, there you see the soul witnessing, that's the eye, re reflecting on its experience, and that's what memory is for, 
and then represent, representation, represent, to represent or to represent means that you grow greater in your capacity to love, to understand, and have empathy and compassion. And to the degree you have empathy and compassion, the false ego dissolves and you realize who I thought I was isn't who I thought I was. And you get to the point where you realize you are the water, you are the sky, you are the forest, you are the mountains, you are the stones, you are the stars twinkling at night, and paradoxically, you are God, and God is you. Now, pathological people think, I am God and you're not, <laughs> or my religion is right and you're not, and that's the belief system. All belief systems, by definition, are closed, and anybody that believes differently gets attacked or ignored because they're not part of the system, right? So, uh, you know, in order to really understand, that's what Rumi meant when he said, to get to God, you got to be a heretic. You got to stop believing in belief systems because they're closed. Your mind is closed. So, when we grow spiritually to the point where we start having mystical union experiences, well, there, you know, it's undeniable. And I've had too many of these things to even count with and without the medicines, doing Tai Chi, meditating, I've become one with the entire universe and completely didn't know it was me till all of a sudden I found myself sitting in meditation and went, holy shit, the universe is me and I'm the universe. We are each other and so is everybody else. And when you realize how magical it is, you start wising up to the fact that the power of the mind of God is absolute. And things can happen a lot faster and a lot more magically than the illusion allows us to think, well, we're trapped in the illusion, but the illusion is what makes it magical. <laughs> 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 because otherwise, you know, if you, if you didn't have to go through an initiation, would it really mean anything to be a warrior? Would it mean would it mean anything to be a mother if you just open your legs and a baby fell out like you farted? You know, <laughs> you know, our the the initiation at every level is to teach us respect, connection, awareness, and responsibility. And you know, sometimes when you're meant to be a medicine carrier. You get initiated into the dark worlds, not because God's trying to be evil or wants to be evil, but that's a polarity in the mind of God. What we call evil is that which draws energy into itself. So, evil is something that accumulates energy and energy like a black hole, no matter what it does to anything else. Love is that which connects to everything else. So, paradoxically, evil at its extreme, or in, in an imbalance, is yin. Yin multiplies power, it draws in. So, people, you know, I'll use Donald Trump as an example. He wants to segregate the United States. He wants to take everybody over. He wants to rule the whole world, kind of like a Hitler. Like, it's my way or the highway, fuck you, I'll blast the shit out of you kind of attitude. Well, that's segregation, but he wants to draw all the power into his own locus. So, he's in control, which is exactly what Hitler was trying to do without concern for the fact that everybody deserves to be here, that this whole world and this whole universe is all of ours, and nobody has the right to do that. And a democracy is where we get together as a collective, and we share out of love and respect for each other and what supports us. We don't drill the fuck and blast the fuck out of things. But the point is, is that because you can't have the experience of time without, to use a Hindu term, Shiva, the destroyer, Vishnu is the maintainer. Brahma is the source from which it all comes, the dreamer. But if there, you know, if you didn't let go of one scene of a movie to get to the next scene, you wouldn't have a movie. So evil is that which takes ideas down and focuses on expanding the self. Love is that which builds ideas up and focuses on building community and sharing. And so those two polarities are just like inhalation, you expand, you grow, and exhalation, you exhale. Evil is that which draws into itself, and love is that which shares itself. So, if you didn't have these two polarities, you would not, you know, when you, when you look at um, cosmology, what do you see? You see stars exploding, 
but then you see black holes sucking everything in. Well, if you're a star having a happy little life and all of a sudden you're being sucked into a black hole to be annihilated, you'd say, that's one evil motherfucker over there. But if you realize that ultimately the greater truth is that all is connected, then evil basically doesn't have the ability to fully unify itself because it's self-centered. You understand? The force of evil can only go so far before it hits an impasse because um, there's nothing outside of itself. But love always is expanding itself and connecting itself. So, paradoxically, if you became the ruler of the world and you controlled everybody, well, one, you'd find that nobody loves you, everyone's afraid of you, no one cares, and, and everybody wants to get rid of you for their own safety. So, you would you know, metaphorically get to the point where you're terribly and utterly alone. And then the only thing you'd be able to do is start reaching out to other people. You might start loving other people that are evil, but ultimately you'd realize they do the same kind of shit to you that you did to them. You can't trust them. So, eventually evil has to reach for love. It's got no other way to go because love is the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassion connection to self or other, regardless of what it is. So, the point I'm making is that love is the truth, but evil is what makes love meaningful, and evil is necessary for this to become that and that to become this, and a lot of the things that we call evil are really just things we don't understand, which is why whenever I confront evil, I'm always asking my soul to show me the love that I'm not seeing so that I can see the other side of the coin. Uh, it's easy to to hate a Hitler. It's easy to hate a Genghis Khan. It's easy to hate someone who's raped somebody that you love. But it's a much deeper spiritual practice to say, what is it in, in my soul contract that I need to understand this about God? And if God is ultimately the source of everything, then we have to look to that source for the ultimate meaning, or we can only circumscribe the events that we see within the limitations of our own consciousness or our own mental structure, which is, for most people, very, very limited. I love it. <laughs> that, that, that wraps us up, brother. Yeah. We hit that hour right on the head. Radio. Well, let's, let's talk real quick uh, about your, your programs. A lot of the stuff that you've talked about today focuses much further, obviously, getting into the rabbit hole of consciousness yeah. and how we heal, how we help others, how we guide. Um, I took HLC Level 1 back in the day when it was Angie's first time coaching, and yeah. she was amazing. It was up in San Francisco. Talk a bit about those programs in the Czech Institute. Well, the Czech Institute has two primary arms which are fused together as a holistic whole in the Czech Academy. The Czech practitioner program begins, it's a holistic approach to the science of corrective exercise and high performance exercise, which begins with Czech exercise coach. Then it goes to, um, it's now called integrated movement science one. So there's IMS one, IMS two, IMS three, IMS four, IMS five, IMS five would be Czech practitioner level four in the old model. And at that level, we're going deep into the psyche, into every aspect of the kinds of things we're discussing. Um, Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 is online. That's my basic course for the public, which you know because you've done it, and it's to teach you the things you need to know to keep your body healthy and, and understand how to live in ways that are sustainable and to live your dream while not destroying the planet or each other. Uh, in, 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 in essence. HLC2 is my first level professional training. It's a five-day intensive course where you learn how to do proper assessments on people's diet and lifestyle factors, mental, emotional factors, how to assess uh, the uh, what what's going on in their chakra system, how to work with mental, emotional challenges and have some tools for that, um, how to design a holistic program, how to um, understand what to do to bring about a healing response in somebody that might have uh, a real health crisis. Um, and so it gives you a, a, a solid toolkit and a proper a structured assessment you can do and the skills to design a program. And you learn uh, various types of meditations, dynamic movement meditations, working in, as I call it. 
Um, and then HLC3 takes you a fair bit deeper. You get into infant development. You learn how to do medical dousing, how to connect to that person's soul and ask for guidance and, and how to use different techniques to understand which systems under a stress and what are the etiologies of that stress, such as uh, trauma, um, sexual abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, um, things that are in the person's unconscious but they can't access, but you can find out through dousing. And, you know, and also we get into the um, responsibility of that spiritually so it's not used as a dark art because anything that can be used to heal can be used to hurt. Thus, we have white witches and black witches and white magicians and black magicians and white brotherhoods and, and black brotherhoods, not in the sense of the color of skin, but in the uh, motives. Um, and then we also get into a very comprehensive system of organ and gland mapping where I mapped out all the neurological pathways and all the reflex pathways and the connections between the glands, the organs, the body parts, the teeth, the reflex points in the body and the hands and the feet. So you can use those maps. For example, if you come to me with chronic right shoulder problem and you've seen a bunch of therapists and it doesn't seem to be going away, I can show you in my maps that the right shoulder links directly to the liver and to the degree that the liver's under stress, it'll downregulate blood flow into the right shoulder complex in order to make sure the liver gets the nutrition and the oxygen it needs to repair itself. And because each gland and organ shares a circulatory supply and a neurological supply, the system's designed to protect the higher order systems first. So someone who's doing a lot of exercise but eating a lot of foods that maybe their body doesn't like or can't process well, be it protein powders or steroids or junk food, um, can easily end up having chronic right shoulder problems because their liver's backed up and under stress because the liver will shut down blood supply and oxygen supply to the uh, right shoulder and arm to the degree that it's competing with the liver's ability to regenerate because you can live without your right arm, but you cannot live without your liver. So the higher order systems of the body, which I describe in my videos on my YouTube channel on the check totem pole, regulate these internal systems. So what it allows people to do is take musculoskeletal pain and problems, which pretty much everybody's aware when they have, and say, okay, which gland or which organ work in concert with the system? And that helps us identify where we need to look and what aspects of their life, their diet or lifestyle, such as are you working around toxic chemicals like a woman working in a beauty salon, breathing in very, very toxic stuff. Now, a lot of those people don't have adequate nutrition to run their cytochrome P40, P448 and P450 pathways or liver detox pathways. So what happens is to the degree the liver is under stress and inflamed, it, it will trigger off pain in the shoulder because each of the muscles in the body is, acts as a a dissipation system for stress, just like you have a fuse box in your house. So if you put too many, too much electricity through a circuit, it'll blow the breaker instead of lighting the house on fire. In your spinal column, in your spinal cord, within the internuncial pool, there are circuits so that if any organ is getting overstressed, it diverts that energy, that extra electro-bioelectrical energy into the muscles that it shares a neurological relationship, which leads to contraction of the muscles, spasm, twitching. For example, when people's um, adrenals are exhausted, you often notice that their eyelids, their eyes will twitch. So the abicularis oculi muscle will fasciculate and it'll look like they've got a twitchy eye. And that's because there's a link between the adrenals and the obicularis oculi, so you see a dissipation of energy. Um, so the organ maps allow a person to do a bilateral analysis. What organs, based on my analysis of their diet, lifestyle, and internal systems, are under stress, and therefore, how does that relate to what they're experiencing in their body, which tells us how far down the road you are, because the worse the internal systems, usually the more pain and dysfunction in the musculoskeletal system segments that are linked to it, and the more pain you have in the muscular. So, if you, if you fall off a ladder and break your back, that can flow into the bladder, that can flow into the colon. So, a person like that can get severe constipation, and nobody can figure out why. A woman may lose her menstrual cycle because there's direct neurological correlations between the L4, 5, L5, S1 discs and the uterus. So we can go musculoskeletal to visceral, visceral to musculoskeletal, and gives us a much more accurate system of assessing so we know how to prescribe diet, lifestyle, practices, stretching, joint mobilization, supplementation, um, hydration, and a wide variety of holistic therapies 
uh, to do that, I teach them a system of maps that I call life process maps. So I show them why we're all here, what happens when you die based on my own investigations into that, um, how to classify their clients into three key psychological groups so they can coach them with the most likelihood of getting a positive result. So I have the biological intelligence, the intellectual intelligence, and the intuitive intelligence. So people that are only at the level of their body and you can't really deal with big concepts with them because it overwhelms them. And people that are trapped in their body aren't ready to deal with, you know, working with power animals and spirit guides. People that are highly intellectual are often the hardest to coach because they're always competing their ideas against yours, even when they're there because their ideas don't work, such as a vegetarian that will fight you tooth and nail that there's that their system produces the greatest health, but I have to remind them, well, how come you're here sick then? So there's an intellectual. So with those people, you have to take them down to the biological level and deal with it at the language of cells and systems and make it very black and white for them. Talk about genes, talk about ancestry, things like that. And then there's the intuitive level, which is the people that are more spiritually evolved, but they often start disowning their bodies and wanting out of their bodies so they often get into vegetarianism and long fasts and, and they start ignoring their bodies. And so they end up trapping themselves because when the body starts uh, becoming unhealthy, it makes it harder and harder for them to enter into the spiritual dimensions. So I teach you how to coach each of these three categories of people based on the psychological profile that they come in with, which is kind of like a structure stage model of consciousness broken into three stages. And then... Um, uh, you know, there's, then I teach them how to put cases together. We, we teach them quite a wide variety. It's a six day course and the days, you know, are typically eight to 10 hours long. And then I have check four quadrant coaching, which goes into archetypes and life path and figuring out what's going on in your un unconscious. I love it. So much to learn. It's and always... TPS success mastery, <laughs> which is go. the 12 challenging lessons that most people get stuck in in life. And I show you how to work through them. Beautiful brother. Well, I love you so much, Paul. I'm love you so too, happy man. you got me here. Thank and, you. Uh, it's always yeah. good to be with you. I I love you, man. You're you're one of my favorite people in the whole world. So keep being you. It's fun. Thank you so much, brother. Love you. Love you, brother. <laughs>